I mean, it was not even close. Okay. Uh, this is the last question I have. Uh, and I, this is really more just me asking you to give me your take on something I've been thinking about. So f- from the study of these revolutionary uh, incidents, it really feels like what it comes down to is numbers. Who, if you can get a, the right amount of people to come out into the streets, right, you can essentially force change on the government. It, it, you, you, if, you can, if you can mobilize a sufficient number of people. And I'm wondering if the, the growing technological asymmetry, basically, that exists between state governments and their citizens is getting to a point where we might be reaching sort of an almost post-revolutionary era where there's no longer any meaningful way to assert a, a demands on a government outside of official channels in a way that can't be counteracted by the astounding array of technology that is at the hand of the states and not at the end of its citizens. And I'm wondering what you think about that. Well, I think my first thing is that a a mass, you know, mass mobilization is of course a, a key part of any successful revolution, but it, so far as I can tell, it always needs to have with it a significant part of what would be called the elite. Uh, if it was feudal times, it would be the aristocracy. Um, somebody who is up there in that, what is today like the billionaire stratosphere, right? So some of the, some of these like real new, uh, like these, these neo robber barons, um, who are, who are currently like in charge of Amazon or in charge of Facebook or something. Um, that those you need to have somebody participating in the revolutionary movement at that level, or the whole thing is going to ultimately fail. I think you, I think you need that. I think you need the money. Um, I think you need the institutional support. And I think that if what you're saying is that, you know, the state has too much technological power, then I think that having some sort of, you you then need again, somebody who's very high up in that sort of uh, in terms of the wealth of the nation and in terms of uh, the technological capacity of the nation to basically be on the side of the revolution. And if you can do that, then I think that any, any system can be, can be toppled. If you don't have that, then yeah, I think, I think the history of the world is, is littered with, you know, what are, what would be like peasant revolts that can, that can blow hot for, three months, six months, even nine months, um, but are ultimately going to fail if they don't have somebody who is a part of the ruling class who wants to remove all of his or her fellows in the, in the ruling class from whatever, uh, whatever had been going on before and make a change to it. So, you know, and is, I mean, let me, let me ask you this, like, is one of the things that you're saying that like control of physical spaces is no longer, uh, enough to, cause like a lot of these things that we've, that I've talked about in revolutions is like, you know, tens of thousands of people literally mobbing into the legislative assembly or into the national convention and forcing the, the legislators there to do things is so is, is maybe one of your questions that that kind of control of physical space isn't going to be, uh, as effective anymore. I mean, not only, it could be less effective, but also could be rendered impossible. I mean, you're looking at look at what's happening now. You've got these new weapons. There's a new pain gun that is now being miniaturized, where it just fires. I think some sort of uh, some sort of sonic wave that just causes intense pain in people that it hits. And uh, in Gaza, we're seeing the deployment of drone operated uh, tear gas where you could clear physical spaces with a very small number of people. So it, it, it wouldn't even, at a, at a certain point, you wouldn't even need to worry about people occupying physical space because you could clear it with a very moderate, very, very low level of, uh, of me- personnel doing it. You don't need the rows and rows of troops who you have to worry are going to switch to the other side. Uh, and, and, and also you have the worrying phenomenon of, of those troops, of, of the forces of the state sort of over time being separated culturally from the people that they're supposed to be part of, whereas they, they're no longer really even seeing their fellow citizens as such. They're seeing them as sort of inferior 
because they're not serving. I mean, we've been we've been cultivating that particular mindset uh, in the U.S. since uh, since Vietnam. But yeah, I mean, th- that's kind of what I'm talking about is just how how that sort of physical space taking at a certain point becomes sort of un- impossible or beside the point if 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 power is decentralized essentially away from capitals and into the hands of a very small number of people who could be anywhere including increasingly maybe in space because a lot of the people we're talking about these the the, the wealthiest the people who are doing the most hyper uh hyper exploitation and, and hyper accumulation are doing it specifically and they've said it publicly like Jeff Bezos with the aim of being able to escape from any kind of human uh, uh, accountability by not being on earth anymore. Yeah, that's very troubling. <laughs> you know, when you, I mean, I think you actually might have said this on on Twitter that it's just like it's really obvious they're just hatching an escape plan at this point. Yeah, like, that's, right out that's in the what open. it like. Like he can't think of anything else to do with like $130 billion than like build a spaceship that'll fly him off the earth. Like there's, there's lots of things that could like, I don't know if nobody's given him like a list of the things that <laughs> could be possibly solved with $130 billion or whatever it is. Um, yeah, it, I, I haven't really, I haven't really thought about it. Um, because I'm, I'm obviously I'm still stuck in the 19th century. Um, but, or before that, like ancient Rome. So is is physical is physical mobilization and is physically capturing a space going to ever be enough like maybe not but if it's all being transferred over to sort of technological digital spaces then i think that there's plenty that could be done to disrupt those very same networks of mass communication that would cripple uh the politicians because w- one thing that i do think is is worth taking into account is that I'm not particularly impressed with the political leadership of the United States at present. Um, <laughs> it doesn't seem like like the actual like literal people who are in charge. And you get you get this with um, say like the way that they were asking questions of of Mark Zuckerberg right when he was brought in to testify about you know the role that Facebook may or may not have played or you know played in the dissemination of, of fake news in the 2016 election. I mean, you could just see the way that these guys are asking questions that they don't really understand the world that they live in anymore. Um, so I don't think it would take much to really throw off at least the political leadership um, in such a way that they, they would find themselves helpless and unable to respond to any kind of coordinated crisis. Because, I mean, they, they barely know how to use email if you take away their email, they're going to be like, well, the email doesn't work anymore. How do I communicate with anybody anymore? And I think they would just kind of be lost. Um, but again, it, it really does come back. And do we have to put a stipulation that like, I'm not recommending any of this? <laughs> like, right, I'm not, of course. not recommending this. What I'm recommending is that we do a better job running our society. So these kinds of things aren't necessary. Um, but you would, you would need somebody who had uh, a, a big hand in the technological and wealth of the society deciding to go on the course of revolution, then I think it could work. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, This was an awesome talk. Uh, This is Mike Duncan, host of the Revolutions podcast. If you're not listening to it, you really should. It's one of the absolute best uh, history podcasts and just podcasts out there. Uh, Mike, thank you for talking to us today. Thank you very much for having me. 